Good evening and welcome to the Velocity of Now with me, your host, Thomas Sheridan. It's the 12th now of February 2015. It'll be that bleeding Valentine's Day tomorrow, you know, where, where all, all, all you women in love get your annual box of chocolates, your bunch of flowers and your ride, and then you're told to get lost for the rest of the year. <clears throat> I know, I'm very cynical, but it's, uh, you know, actually, do you know that the the St. Valentine is a, a, a dead saint in a box in Dublin. Like, it's a skull with some bones, and it's all run by the Carmelite nuns, I think. So that's, like, real romantic. Uh, some guy's bones in a box. It's probably the only bone that the nuns get at uh, Valentine's. I shouldn't say that, but I did. Yeah, we got a, I've got a huge show tonight. I better get true to this, because I'm only, what, 59 minutes from Tulpas. Uh, speak... Uh, that, that's, that's a very bad Gene Pitney accent. I always think of Phoenix. Oh, speaking of Phoenix Knights, that TV show, that sitcom, last year I did a, I did a, a talk in one in Hull, in a working man's, a real, like, in north of England working man's club in Hull. And when I got there, I was looking for somebody, and I got talking to the barman, and he was looking for somebody to open the room, and he goes, we got lad here who's going to talk about Luminati. It really was like it was like Phoenix Knights meets uh, meets conspiracy. Anyway, salutations, good evening, and welcome to the Velocity of Now. I'll try to get serious from this point on. I got wonderful feedback from last week's show. Apparently, the HAL uh, 2001 Space Oddity Cyber Sex went down with all you uh, degenerates, and some of you got a great laugh out of my impromptu uh, impression of the. Uh, Sinead O'Connor. Tonight's a full show. My website is thomasheridanarts.com. My YouTube channel is Thomas Sheridan Arts. If you want to look at the video, the uh, the surrealist man videos of this show, go to newsymbolsmedia.tv and also all the links pertaining to the topics of tonight's show, which is really about cannibalism, corpses, and you know quantum gins. Uh, you'll find them all there. Well, the ones I can supply. Now, uh, tonight, before I get started, I just want to talk about that that video of the two kids in Hampstead in England that's doing the rounds. I don't think people should be sharing that publicly on their wall, even if they think the story is legit. I don't. Uh, because those kids will, could be damaged later on in life through either bullying or stigmatization. So if you do want to, if you had to share that video about the two kids talking about being, you know, raped and uh, brought to churches where they sacrificed babies and danced on the skulls and all this nonsense, go to uh, go do it in in private messages. Don't be doing it publicly. I have to give kudos to Infowars.com for making a very, for them, mature video on the subject where they showed uh, the kids' faces blurred out, and they agreed. They basically agreed, like myself, the thing is a hoax. The kids are clearly being coached, and the adults in that video need to be investigated, particularly the guy who says, t- coaches them, or should I say grooms them, to say fear is the mind killer, and they can't wait to, uh, to answer him back uh, exactly as he told them. And I was half waiting for him to give them a bag of sweets at the end, and it's disgusting. But anyway, that's... Uh, now, I'm not saying that these things don't happen. Of course they do. I'm going to be covering a story from history and a few things like this tonight. But that doesn't mean that you have to go ballistic and bonkers and throw the stuff all over the place. So, you know, be careful with that stuff. You, the kids will be doubly abused by sharing those videos off them. If you must do it, do it privately or share the ones where their faces are blurred out. I just don't think it's right. Those kids who don't even know what they're saying are all over the Internet. Oh, someone asked me what other shows do I like. Well, uh, after this show, I haven't heard much of it, because, but after this show is George and Dee. Apparently he's picking up on similar topics to what I'm talking to tonight. But the other shows I do listen to are The Bridge with Kira, The Opperman Report with Ed Opperman. I like Tom Sacker's Spy Culture's broadcasts. And The Moon Lodge, that's out every new moon with uh, Carrie Lee and Kira Young again. I love, I love James Corbett's The Corbett Report. He's done a great one this week on the Aliens PSYOP. And Carrie Lee also has a new show coming out on People's Internet Radio on 
her own recipe for anarchy stuff. That's the name of her website. Website is res- recipeforanarchy.com. It's brilliant, actually. And I like my Niall Murphy's or opaque lens, as he calls them. Sorry, sorry, Niall. I can never, ever call you opaque lens. It's much too hippie for me. But uh, he has a show called Shamanic Freedom Radio, which I, be- I barely let him away with that title. And uh, Niall's got a very good podcast this week, and it's kind of the opposite. Of, he's, he's getting more prosaic and grounding. Grounded. I'm getting a little more, bit more uh, out there, shall we say? But that's okay. You know, that's how things we progress. I'm, I'm proud of my, uh, I'm proud of my ignorance because as long as I'm ignorant, I'll always have the joy of learning. Anyway, the first story I want to talk to tonight is a doozy. This is gonna love. I love this one. You remember Charles Manson was going to get married to some, some chick in her twenties? Well. Does it just come out tonight that the whole thing was a, a weird and interesting scam? I'm going to read this for you now. Charles Manson's fiance allegedly only wanted him for his corpse. So that really brings up, you only wanted me for my body. Well, it's true in his case. Corcoran, California. The news of infamous criminal Charles Manson's recent engagement to a woman in her 20s turned some heads late last year. But a new twist in the story is even more unbelievable. According to the New York Post journalist, Daniel Simone, told the tabloid that the engagement was a scheme by the fiancé to profit from putting Manson's body on public display after his death. Simone and a collaborator, Heidi Jordan, are currently working on a book, The Retrial of Charles Manson. The authors claim to have spoken with Manson regularly before his phone privileges were suspended. Manson, 80, can you believe that he's 80 now? And Afton Elaine Burton, who according to the Post is now 27 and goes by the name Star, applied for a marriage license in November. That's last year, 2014. The license expired last week, but they had originally planned to reapply for another. But now, in an unexpected twist, as if that wasn't weird enough, Simone told the Post that it was all a scheme. Burton and a friend, Craig Hammond, said they'd planned to place Manson's remains inside a glass crypt after his death, similar to the famous tomb of Vladimir Lenin in Moscow. They believed it would be a popular attraction for tourists. They hatched their plan after leaving, after learning that Burton married Manson, California, la- California law would give her possession of Manson's remains. According to the New York Post, Simone and Manson didn't want to marry Burton anymore. According to the New York Post, Simone said, sorry, I read that wrong. According to, it's very small text. According to the New York Post, Simone said, Manson doesn't want to mar- marry Burton anymore. Oh, his heart was a little, a little heart was broken. He finally realized that he'd been played for a fool. Oh, there's certainly a song in that. that that's, that's, that's interesting for him, you know, a, a, uh, the irony of Charles Manson being played for a fool by a woman, considering, you know, he had Squeaky Frome and Susan Atkin and the rest of them. Simone told the paper Manson believes he is a mortal. Therefore, he feels it's a stupid idea to begin with. <laughs> like like he's, he's an elf or something. He's like, uh, what's his name in The Lord of the Rings? He's the leader of the elves, Elrond. Manson faces a life sentence and is currently serving at a California state prison in Corcoran, California. He's not eligible for parole on 2027. Well, if he's a mortal, he'll get out of prison. No doubt about that. That's, this story is just... I've only just... Uh, I've only just, uh, you know, found out about this story. And, um, you know, this is, a, this, is, this is the stream of thought coming into my head. What was she after? Is she a member of a cult? And is this some kind of weird cult thing? Is it just a quick cash-in thing? Is it just a funny idea? I kind of am. I kind of would want to see the the corpse of Charles Manson in a glass box. I don't know why. It'd be more of a curiosity. It'd probably be better if they had like a little a little kind of swastika on his forehead. If that was made into a propeller with a motor and spun around on the top of his head, that might be kind of cool, or something like that. I don't know what the real thing for that was, but they definitely would have been on for a winner because uh, there's enough weirdos out there who would want to see him, including myself. That's also interesting about the the Vladimir Putin 
Uh, sorry, Putin. That's wrong. Putin. That's, that's the wrong, wrong Russian, Russian dictator. The Lenin uh, body inside that tomb in, in Moscow. I find that so strange. A temple in a so-called atheistic system. Well, you know, we all know that Marxism and Bolshevism was never atheist to begin with. But that's a, in both cases we're talking about the death cult, the idea of the worship of the corpse. This is a something that's always fascinated me, the idea of, of a cult based upon debt, either the cult embracing a doomsday event like a comet, the end of the world, or some kind of harbingers of, of, of destruction, like the, the Christian idea of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, or the idea of the actual the dead body being a, 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 a object of worship itself. Similar, funny enough, to what I was saying about St. Valentine and his box of bones tomorrow. They, they will be lining up out on the street in Dublin to, to actually see the box of bones to celebrate love. Uh, Catholicism is great this, that way. You know, you have all these churches in the Mediterranean countries and Portugal and Spain and Italy and Croatia that are made out of bones and skulls. And, and then you have the Mexicans who have the Day of the Dead. On one level, it's actually it's very good. It's very healthy. On another level we in the West are not mature enough to be involved in this kind of thing, especially like in the English-speaking countries, because the actual worship of the corpse and the bones is what really, you know, is what really would happen and really takes place, rather than in these Mediterranean countries where they, and Latin countries, where they don't actually worship the bones, but they, they, they remember and think about the meaning of life and death and all this kind of thing. We in the English world, unfortunately, in the speaking world, don't don't have that kind of maturity and depth in relation to debt. We kind of live in fear of debt because we can't take all our material garbage with us. But I knew there was something not right about, you know, apart from the obvious, you know, it didn't seem, when the story first broke, it didn't st- seem like the the typical, you know, erotomanic, uh, histophilia, crazy chick, who falls in love with a serial killer? It didn't seem that way. There was something. She was too. She was for a starter. She was too interesting looking. She didn't look like one of those kind. Like generally, those kinds of women, they're usually sort of suburbanites. They don't really have an interesting life. They don't really have a an interesting background. They're very mundane. This this woman looking at her that wanted to marry Charles Manson. She had. She was kind of cool looking. It's kind of interesting looking. But uh, there you go. Charles, he's got a broken heart. You know, I could just, I could just see him now sitting there. She broke my heart. There's, a, there's definitely a country song in there somewhere, you know. She broke my heart because she only wanted my carbs to put on display. She wouldn't get me a hers. She put me in a glass box Cause I couldn't get in hers Cause I am immortal Charles Manson Yeah, there's definitely a song in there somewhere Yeah, it's it it, it there used to be an, uh, an American right-wing radio talk show host I used to listen to back in the day on, on W, I think it was NBC the AM station, whatever it was in New York, the news station, and he used to go, Bob Grant was his name, and he was a right-wing commentator, but he was funny, and he was, uh, he'd always go with, uh, he'd always finish the show with, it's sick, and getting sicker, well, I don't think I could change that, it's surreal, and getting more surreal, I mean, I didn't watch the, the Grammys or anything this, this week, but that's all dead cult stuff new, too. Poor Whitney Houston's daughter having the life support pulled on the same day as her mother. And there's all these kinds of weird things that go on in music. Uh, uh, you know, like the guy from Boney M who sang Rasputin dropping, what did he drop dead on Rasputin's bear to Leningrad or something like that? It was just, you couldn't make these things up. The music, it's, uh, you know, we, we, this is why I could never actually become and stay a. Uh, an atheist or an agnostic, but there's just too many synchronistic, synchromistic things that go on. Like just even tonight's show, I started off talking about the the bones of the dead Saint Valentine in a box, and 
I did, I, and then I went without even thinking about it or even knowing about it. I was going, I was going to talk about that anyway. I hear about like Charles Manson's body in a glass box, you know. And that's they're the kind these synchronicities. The more they happen, the more you embrace them, the more you go with them because they're like a muscle. They they really are true. They they they, you know they, the more you work at it, the more you notice them and it's not coincidence it's not anything like that now I caused a I caused a bit of a furor not so long ago when I spoke about Guinness and all these people going how can you say bad things about Guinness uh, you know it's 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 a it's the sacred beverage of my liver destruction how dare you say that it's made out of soot and it's they, it's not vegetarian. They use fish scales, and you know, Arthur Guinness was a, a notorious anti-Catholic who saw himself as British and not Irish, and it's the you know that kind of thing. And I've been to the I've been to the Guinness brewery in Dublin, and I, and I and I've gone to the top of that building like Muhammad went to the top, like like Moses went to the top of the feckin' mountain Mount Sinai and brought back the Ten Commandments. That happened to me at the Guinness Visitor Center. How dare you! How dare you tell me that Guinness is not 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 some kind of sainted? You know, I could that would be a funny one to do. Where uh, what was his name? Eh, uh, I'm not show through the through the keyhole. I should. That's something I should need. I should do in some later episodes of the Velocity of Now and the comedy spe- sketch. You'd have that. That would be a show on that used to be on the daytime with uh, what's his name? That David. Uh, I can't. David Frost. You know the guy who interviewed. I interviewed Nixon, that guy, and uh, Lloyd Grossman, the guy who makes, you know, sauces like a... That guy. And uh, I should call it Through the Arsehole or something like that. And that would be funny. That, that sh- that's a good one. I should do that. You know, who would live in a place like this? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Grossman. <laughs> now then, now then. Oh, I, I, definitely should, I definitely have to do that. I could have a lot of fun with that. But, uh, yeah, you didn't like the Guinness stuff. Well, now I'm going to double compound your horror as we approach St. Patrick's Day by telling you about something. Well, it's, it's really quite, it's, it's, it's revolting, right? Arthur Guinness and whatever Guinness have done, they are, they are sainted. They are, they, are, they are innocent flowers compared to the, the, the Jemison story. And you won't believe that one, okay? Now, before I get to it, I have a personal family history with the Jemison, the Jemison distilleries in the north side of Dublin, Bow Lane and Marabone Lane, and around Smithfield. The distilleries were absolutely massive and gigantic. My grandfather worked there for 30 years until he had to take an early retirement at 50-something, because he'd lost a finger when a, a something fell on him, and they gave him a few a few quid, and then they they, they threw him out. My his father worked there for fifty years, so eighty years in the same distillery, and because they were both Catholics, they could only get the crap jobs there. At Je- Jemison, like Guinness, the Catholics did not get the good jobs. The Dublin, although it's in the south of Ireland, was still very much Anglo centric up until I was even a kid. And my both of their jobs were, and you would not believe this, they used to be gigantic barns, or kind of like warehouses, massive things. And the floors were all covered in whatever they make whiskey from, barley, or I don't know what they make whiskey from. But their job was, I'm not kidding, for 50 years and 30 years, to walk up and down these long halls with a rake, turning the grain over. Going to the end, and coming back. That was the only jobs that you could get at Jemison if you were Catholic. And that's because sectarianism was, was rife even in Dublin up until the 60s. Against, you know, the establishment were very much Anglo-Irish Presbyterian. Now, it wasn't always like that's you know, but that's, that's, you know, there was still a lot of the old companies that functioned like that. And so I have a personal history. Not, so I don't drink whiskey anyway. I, I just... It just doesn't sit well with me. I don't like whiskey, and so I'm, you know, it's never, it's not, it's not something I can take inside my. It doesn't agree with my constitution, as they say. But the next story, I wanted to devote 
a good bit to it. So, uh, Paul, if you're listening here on www.realitybitesradio.com, which is the the hosting station, to uh, uh, the wonderful hosting station for this program, if you could put on the first song, well, because I want to get, I don't, I want to get to the next story, next part of the Jemison horror, uninterrupted. If you could do that, please. And this is uh, Armageddon Time by The Clash. And that was Armageddon Time by The Clash. Now, we've got, I've got so much to go through tonight, I hope I can squeeze it in, but this next story is from a website called theincuition.eu, and it's about uh, John Jemison, who was the heir to... James, sorry, James S. Jemison, who was the heir to the Jemison whiskey family. Now, the family originally came to Ireland from Scotland, and they were part of the same... They were like the kind of Wedgwoods of whiskey brewing. They came from the, the Stein and the Hague families, powerful they basically invented the whiskey business to be honest now this uh, this story i'm going to tell going to tell you now is quite disturbing so it's probably not good for ch- there's children in the room or anything like that if they are or even if you're a bit squeamish but this it talks about a story that was covered in the new york times in 1890 called the horrible jemison affair and it kind of you know even though at the beginning of the show i'd mentioned about the whole thing of i don't you know but well, we'll talk about this later. But I'll just read the story. But it kind of does validate a lot of the, a lot of the, shall we say, speculation about the aristocrats and their obsession with child murder and things like that. The horrible Jemison affair refers to the allegations that a fast-living colonialist for hire and heir to the whiskey distillery empire, James S. Jemison, procured a, gir- a girl solely to watch her being eaten. The accusations were made in 1890, two years after the alleged incident. James S. Jemison was the heir to the Jemison Irish whiskey giant. His account of the time in the rear column was published pos- posthumously by his wife and brother in an attempt to combat charges of disobedience, disloyalty, forgetfulness of promises, desertion, cruelty, cowardice, and even more leveled at him by Sir Henry Morton Stanley. Assad Farron was a Syrian translator who accompanied Jemison on his journey with Tipu Tip. It was Farron... Faran, who made the contentious and inflammatory disposition against Jemison. Bart Telot was an officer colleague of Jemison, left in command of the rear column in Yambuya in the modern-day Democratic Republic of Congo. Bart Telot would eventually be shot as he attempted to strike a woman. At the same time, Jemison died of fever elsewhere. Tipu Tip was a notorious blind slave trader plantation owner and governor who worked for a succession of sultans of Zanzibar. He rose to prominence through his ruthless and ruthlessness and would eventually become a very wealthy and very powerful. By all accounts, he was a man to be feared. You can already tell this is kind of like a very dark circle we're going into now of Victorian aristocrats. Amin Pasha was a true 19th century country gentleman, virtually the paradigm of Jules Verne ca- character. A German doctor and naturalist, he was appointed the governor of Equatoria, but he had become besieged after the fall of Sudan. Sir Henry Morton Stanley, of the Dr. Livingston fame, was in the employment of King Leopold of Belgium to install a Belgian colony in the free state. Stanley was one of the leaders of the expedition to rescue Emin Pasha. Now, we could go and talk about Belgium, but Belgium had only hadn't been around that long. It had basically been invented by the British Empire as a kind of... Um, shall we say, a Switzerland of the Northeast, which it still is to this day for globalist purposes. And the Belgian royal family was was basically a, a subset of the British royal family that was moved to Belgium to create this uh, artificial dynasty. So one of the few detail, details of the episode that would be uncontested was the start of the affair. Jemison found himself with Tipu Tip and his translator Asad Faran at Reba Kiba, depending on the source, place names was a flexible phonization of the vernacular. There are several ways you can pronounce that. Now known as Loch Kandu, it is a township in the Democratic Republic of Congo that sits on a virtual, at the virtual center of Africa. At the time, Rikabikaba was a trading stop on the Lulaba River, a headstream of the Congo, the Congo River, that is. The town was a major stop in slave and ivory trade routes. So that sounds, you know, you can tell it's a dark energy a, a dark malignant energy there already a lawless frontier town the men were looking for porters of which they would eventually get 400 
The men were part of the Imam Pasha relief expedition. The expedition's stated aim was to relieve the besieged Imam Pasha. It was really an expeditionary foray, masterminded by the Belgian royalty and employing cooperative Europeans in an exploratory journey into the heart of darkest Africa. King Leopold was suffering from regal anxiety and had decided he needed vast swathes of sub-Saharan real estate to allow him to compete with other European monarchs. Well, he was really British, so this would have ultimately went to the Saxe, Coburg and Gothas, Battenbergs and the Hessens and the Hanoverians in London. The men were to evaluate the lands. Jemison and Bartholot had been left in command of the expedition's rear column, something they failed to do in spectacular fashion. When Sir Henry Morton Stanley returned to review the joint command, he found only 60 of the 270 men still fit to serve. The camp's conditions were described in all the pressing details by Farran in his later affidavit. Now, we're looking at a psychopath here. This is a serious... We're looking at this guy, Jemison, as a hardcore psychopath already. The fact that he would show no decent treatment or have any kind of uh, good organizational, administrative or logistic skills for the men under his duty. Bartholot and Jemison claimed they were hampered in their duties by lack of Belgian steamers on the Congo. The usual story, pass it off. They said their station was remote and isolated. King Leopold had promised steamers for the expedition which had not materialized and the expedition was forced to use boats that could be dismantled and carried. The expedition at Zanzibar for the heart of Africa on the 25th of February 1886. Faran set the scene by describing cruelty and severity at the Yambuya camp. He described the camp as having to split the factions in an indictment of laissez-faire attitudes adopted by the camp commanders. Faran recounted how at Rib Akabia, Jemison had said to him that he was curious about the practice of cannibalism. This is where it gets dark, so you prepare yourself for this stuff which he believed was a common among the natives. Apparently he was correct. It was relatively common. Jemison wanted to see it performed and decided to buy a slave for the purpose. Just business. He paid six handkerchiefs for a 10-year-old girl. The detail would later stand out as essentially correct and uncontested. Along with a group of men brought her to the cannibal's hut. Through the interpreter, the men were told, this is a present from the white man who wishes to see her eaten. The girl was tied to a tree and her belly gouged twice with a knife. She looked around for assistance from the hostile group surrounding her. The girl remained silent as blood gushed from her abdomen. She was resigned to her fate. When dead from the blood loss, she was cut into pieces by the men who had sharpened their knives nearby. Faran told how Jemison drew and drew and sketched throughout the entire ordeal. Jemison, he said later, rendered these sketches in six delicate watercolours. The girl being led away, it's so typically, you know, psychopathic imperialism, you know, a, a young girl, ten years old, being butchered to be eaten, and Jemison renders it in six delicate watercolours. Oh, this is my time in the Belgian Congo. And this is a time that I, I, I paid for a, a for six handkerchiefs for a young girl to be eaten, and so I could sketch away. This is literally how this psychopath was thinking, and this is how these psychopaths are. The stabbing and gushing blood, the dissection, and the final butchery, Jemison displayed his works to the chiefs for their approval. A letter from Jemison appeared in the New York Times on the 15th of November, 1890, his defense was made pos posthumously through his wife's correspondent with the newspaper and consisted of a letter Jemison had written to Sir William McKinnon. The letter had been composed as Jemison was dying at Stanley Falls, August 3, 1888. Strangely, it deals with minor details and accusations which had only come to light two years later in Ferran's affidavit, which led some credibility to the accusations. Jemison described how he bought, brought to the local chief's house where a cannibalistic ceremony was already in progress. Jemison was told by Tipu that he would witness cannibalism. Jemison replied in the negative, said it was impossible and he did not wish to believe it might happen. Liar. Tipu had said, he said, pushed the point and asked for six handkerchiefs so they might prove him wrong. At this point, Jemison concedes he did not, he did provide the handkerchiefs. They would lead anyone to wonder why he had such items or why he went to lengths to procure and provide the payment that would secure a girl's debt, a debt he claims was he was averse to. At any rate, 
all tellings of the story collaborate that a girl's life was worth a mere six handkerchiefs. Jemison said, It all happened too quick to sketch. Had he wanted to, which he goes on to restate, he didn't because he was shocked. The lady doubt protest too much, me thinks. I agree with the, the author of this blog. You know what they say, the truth is, you know, the truth is obvious. A lie takes a story, takes an epic. And we're getting a classic case of this here. Jemison then want to accuse Assad of fraud in camel dealings in a thinly veiled and feeble attempt at character assassination. Well, that's the classic psychopath for you. You know, they, do, they don't uh, admit it or say anything. They, they distract. They, they project to somebody else. So he, he went after this guy, Assad to try and distract from his own thing. That's a classic psychopath thing. They never say, I'm guilty or I'm innocent. They say, that guy over there is worse than me. That's how a psychopath does it. Both sides had much to gain and lose. On balance of probability, there may have been some truth in the accusations, particularly in light of Stanley's portrayal as Jemison as a disdainful character. Congo at the time was a dangerous and unstable place. The Luba Kingdom arose in the 16th century and eventually fell victim to the European expansionism in the late 19th century. This was darkest Africa, a continent of myth, legend and heroism, full of danger, both animal and human, a land that might swallow up the unprepared. It was seen as a dangerous land beyond the reach of law. Sadly, these tales appear to have been more, have more than a grain of truth to them, but much of this barbarism and intrigue was of European origin, or at least in support of colonial aims. Jemison certainly seems to have acted in this cavalier manner, according to many witnesses. Assad was later ordered by Sir Francis de Winton to sign a declaration that the story was untrue. De Winton was the administrator general of the Belgian Congo and a secretary of Emin Pasha relief expedition a man who had much to lose if it was believed that men were supporting cannibalism under his watch. Any story was possibly, possibly true. I believe that this story is true. Uh, this is what happens when you have a psychopath in a powerful, a powerful wealthy family. There is no, there is no, you know, there's no limits on their, on their pathology on a petitioner it does not exist and so they will they think nothing of it it shows how they this is how they see their servants they don't see other you see it's very easy for us to say oh it's because she was a poor african girl she was not wasn't a full human to him but look at the early part of the story of how he treated the men under his under his you know these would have been european men mostly belgian and british troops under his command in the rear column of the expeditionary force and they were they were left in chaos the whole thing fell apart he didn't care about them either it, this is how the uh, this is how the anglo prussian anglo elite crackers with the cap in living in palaces this is how they are they don't care about they think that everyone that's not one of them is a subhuman and is disposable now, why are the elites and the wealth and the wealthy and the super wealthy obsessed with cannibalism? Why is Dracula always a noble? It's there's, because they see human beings that are not of the elite, the ones who work their farms, their peasants. They see them in the same way as their cattle and their livestock. They dehumanize them. So eventually they go, a cow is food, a lamb is food, a fish is food, and these humans on my estate, they're also food subconsciously. They see it the same way. It's not that they, they, they have empathy as a, or, or against people or for people or compassion of the other human beings because they don't see them and this is why I will always make it you know you know me I'm not Mr. Sora hysterical I don't jump on every conspiracy but I do believe that unchecked unchecked these aristocrats these the likes of Bill Gates these super rich types these super rich types you know when you have when you have someone like 
Tony Blair and George Bush saying they started the Iraq 2 war because they got messages from God, from Jesus Christ. That's, t that's them telling you that they see themselves as gods upon this earth. That's what they're telling you. And if, our, we, if we didn't constantly fight for our rights and fight for our dignity, they would be eating us. They would be eating us. They'd be starting with the children. They'd be eating us. Now, I want to read another article here about aristocratic privilege and more than blood. And this is from my own, my own blog, which you can get to from thomasheridanarts.com. You just, just click the link saying, uh, saying official blog. And it, takes you just, it takes you just. But the article, anyway, I'll post it in the, in the topic section of newsymbolsmedia.tv. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just so upset about reading that story. But we have to confront these things. It's important to know what kind of monsters are running this world. And this is my, from my own blog. The most prolific psychopathic female serial killer in history was a lady of the nobility. In later years, she be, would become known as Countess Dracula. However, in her heyday of aristocratic murder and sacrifice, she was known as Countess Elizabeth Bathory de Esquesse. Guest, a blood-drinking aristocrat who left a legacy of more than horror in the Kingdom of Hungary between 1560 and 1641. During her lifetime, her reputation caused her to become known as the Blood Countess. At first, her victims tended to be local peasant girls. See what I was saying about they're just livestock? And from this, she began killing servants and the maids of the court. Again, just livestock. She she's also accused of murdering the daughters of the rivals, daughters of rivals, and less prestigious nobility. Less prestigious nobility is the is the factor here. During the investigation into her activities, it was revealed that there existed a secret network, just like we had today with Savile and the royal family, from Vienna to Belgrade, which captured and supplied her with young girls. Witnesses stated in her posthumous trial. Just like the other guy, Jemison, it's always posthumous. They're never found. These super elites are never found guilty in their own life, just like Savile. This almost proves to me that Savile was royalty, and the Duchess was a Duchess. It was stated in her posthumous trial that the victims' bodies were generally buried in local graveyards. Following the death of her husband, the Countess and several royal collaborators began amassing victims which by some estimates reached over 6,000 young girls and women. This is one woman who did this now. She was one aristocratic woman, psychopath. She was never formally charged, tried, nor convicted for her horrific crimes during her lifetime. However, she did remain under house arrest for the last four years of her life. A proper investigation into her crimes was not conducted until long after her death. And some of the testimonies and accusations were unfathomable in terms of the sheer pravity, which included taking baths in the blood of virgins she and her collaborators had kidnapped and murdered. In Hungary and Slovakia for centuries afterward, Countess Elizabeth Bateroy's presence looms large in the collective vote law. She's all, there's also speculation that the extent of her horrors could have been sexed up, to use a modern term as part of a Reformation propaganda that would have been between Catholics and Protestants, or in this case Protestants against Catholics. But even if the numbers of murders are exaggerated, and bear in mind they could be accurate too, she was by all accounts a vicious serial killer nonetheless. Of course, royalty and nobility's taste for human flesh is hardly restricted to Eastern Europe. British royalty for centuries have dined on human flesh and used everything from powdered human skulls, at one time human skulls for consumption were one of Ireland's largest exports to the UK, to England, sorry, not the UK, to the organs of executed prisoners being ingested for alleged medical, sexual and life-enhancing benefits. Dr. Richard Sugg's book, Money, Mummies, Ma Cannibals and Vampires, is an excellent insight into the cannibalistic dietary practice of Darwin's favoured races. So you see, I've, I'm having a lot more time and a lot more understanding for people who talk about the elites and cannibalism and, and rampant sexuality on, on children and all this kind of thing because the historic evidence does support that there's something going on there. 
Now, another story that just that came to me tonight, somebody sent it to me, and I'd never heard of this one before. And I'm going to post, I'll post a wiki article into newsymbolsmedia.com, but it's worth reading this article just because of the horrific conditions in which Barcelona, the city of Barcelona in, Catal- in the Catalan, which is now part of Spain, had and how it was and how awful and horrible the city was and to live in and how desperate the lives of the people that lived there between the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century. It was almost like a psychic firestorm. And this story is surrounds a woman called Ariquita Marti. She was a Catalan woman who moved to the city and she was again a classic psychopath and she she lived a double life during the day she dressed in rags and begged at houses of charity convents and parishes in the destitute parts of town where she had selected children who looked the most abandoned taking the children by hand she made them pass as her own children later she prostituted or murdered them she did not have any need to beg since her double work as a procurer and a prostitute gave her sufficient money to live well. By night she dressed in luxurious clothes, hats and wigs, and attended El Liceo, the casino of the ambassadors, and other places where wealthy, where the wealthy of Barcelona gathered. It is prob- probable that in these places she offered her services as a procurer of children. In 1909, of the tragic week, she was arrested in her flat in Minerva Street. That's even interesting, it was in Minerva Street, in Barcelona, accused of running a brothel that offered sexual services for children between the ages of 3 and 14 years of age. With her, a young man of a wealthy family was arrested. Thanks to her contacts with the High Barcelona Society, they were contracting her services as a procurer of children, Enriquita was never tried and the matter of the brothel was lost in the judicial and bureaucratic system. So it's a, she's like a savile. She's a savile of... You see, when people say, oh, you know, uh, they, a lot of people in the alternative scene, they go too far in saying that there's, you know, there's these elite networks of rich people who, who, who kill and murder and have sex with children. Well, the historic record... You see, you don't have to talk about aliens and nonsense or Crowley or any of that kind of thing. You don't have to talk about that. Just look at the actual, hard, verified history. It's there. Rich, wealthy, sons of bitches, raping and eating eating the poor. At the same time she was prostituting children, she was also practicing as a witch doctor. Now, wait to hear this part. The ingredients she used to make her remedies were made from the remains of children that she was killing, who ranged from infants up to children of nine years old. So, from a baby to a nine-year-old, she was killing and making ingredients, medicines from their body. From these children, she used everything that she could, the fat, blood, hair and bones which normally she crushed into powder for this reason she did not have problems disposing of the bodies of her victims and Rikita offered slaves salves, sorry, ointment filters, cataplasm and potions, especially to treat tuberculosis which was highly feared at the time and all kinds of diseases that did not have a cure in traditional medicine Wealthy people were paying large sums of money for these remedies. Now, why are they obsessed with children? Why do they want to eat the bodies of children? Because of the age. Young children are not... They want sex with the young children, the elites, because young children don't have venereal disease. Generally, they wouldn't have BD like the regular prostitutes in Barcelona or London, New York, anywhere. That's one of the reasons. Another reason why they would want the flesh of these children to eat is because, likewise, they would be seen as not having suffered from tuberculosis. 
So the irony is, if you were a sick and unwell child on the streets of Barcelona, you probably would have survived. If you were a young, healthy child, you probably would have ended up being consumed, your body parts and your body fluids, by wealthy aristocrats. Wealthy people were paying large sums of money for these remedies, and they knew what they were. They always have. And you telling me the royal families of Britain don't do this today? It is suspected that she kidnapped an indeterminate, though large number of children. Since she operated over a span of 20 years, she was finally arrested in her flat in, the, in El Rabal, in the mezzanine number 29 on Ponen Street, today Joaquim Costa Street. More evidence was found in flats in Barcelona where she'd lived previously. The forensic experts managed to differentiate a total of 12 children and what little evidence they were able to recover. In spite of suspicions and because of Enrique did not tally her activities, experts are unsure if she was the deadliest killer that ever existed in Spain. It is clear that she acted for many years in Barcelona. Additionally, the public suspected that someone was kidnapping babies. There were many children who disappeared out of trace and there was dread among the population. So, again... You know, we can, we can laugh at all the people in the alternative movement who talk about the stuff that go on with children. But remember, these people in Barcelona, these people, these poor people in Barcelona would have been saying, there's rich people taking our children and having sex and killing them and eating them. And they would have been laughed at as the, as the, as the batshit crazy kooks of their day. But it still was happening. Now this... The occult aspects I want to talk about briefly before the top of the year and we get into the second, the second part of the show. The occult aspects, I hear an awful lot of people in this movement talk about, oh, it's all Crowley. It's all, Crowley's the one they all follow. I completely disagree with that. I don't think they're into it at Crowley at all. I, I know a lot about ritual magic. I've been called the witch in my lifetime, something I'm actually proud of. And I've never been a member of a magic circle, but I do know quite a lot about it. And I um, can tell you for a fact, whatever the elites practice in these stately homes, it is not Thelema. It is not any Crowley stuff. It's not. Crowley was the quite opposite of an aristocrat. In fact, he lived very modest. He had nothing on his life, and he, he lived in absolute poverty. And that's because he believed that a minimalization of your living existence, like the whole idea of a living in, in a minimal space, with less stuff, less distractions, allowed you to contain energy that was needed for magical rituals. So and you had like lots of bling, lived in a large home with lots of paintings and jewels and stuff like that. You, you could not practice the Lima in the Crowley sense because you could not harvest that energy because you were, it was, your objects steal your energy. That's why things like Black Friday and shopping malls are really a, a kind of a black magic magnet. They're sucking the energy out of the people who go to these places, energy they need for themselves to do. I'm not just about magic, but they need that energy to fight diseases and things like that. They need that energy to think straight and not vote for idiot politicians I, I absolutely believe that the elites, the super elites are involved in some kind of ritual, magic, sorcery we've been given hints of it the nearest, the nearest I can attain to it is that it has something to do with sex magic it's very sexually orientated and it has something to do with drugs and alcohol there seems to be a common theme in, these aristoc in this aristocratic cult, it's based on drugs, alcohol, sex, in large homes. And there's a reason for that too as well. We'll get to in a second. And it involves cannibalism, and it involves children. And what it is, how they go about it, I don't know. But those, those factors seem to always be present. If you watch... Eyes Wide Shut by Kubrick. He shows the girl who almost dies from taking the naked girl, beautiful naked girl in the room, who almost dies from taking drugs. He's telling us that's what goes on with these things, sex and drugs and children. Now, 
it's de- they're definitely doing something. It started in Prussia about 200 years ago, and it still goes on. And what kind of magic it is, I don't know, but it's absolutely not Crowley. Crowley is overrated in terms of his his influence, shall we say, on the elites. In fact, he's, it, there's nothing in the elites that you can find that relates back to Crowley. Nothing. None of it. If you really look, there's nothing there. Now, if you were to ask me what is the main, shall we say, indicator that these rituals are going on, I would say longevity. I would say longevity. It was known among the, the shoguns in Japan that having sex with younger and younger women and boys did extend life. This is also why in the Islamic world they have younger and younger brides. I'm not putting down Muslims. I'm just saying that's what that originally came from. That that was a that was a pre-Islamic idea of the young eight and nine year old bride that came from Zoroastrianism and various other Persian sects, S E C T S, that did the same. Look for people who live a long time both at the top echelon of big business politics and royalty and seem to be fairly fit I would reckon that they're involved in this occult aspect that these people are involved in now what is magic I keep telling you magic is not necessarily supernatural beings and supernatural It's the changing of consciousness. It's the changing and the conforming of others with your will. If you can train yourself to do this, as I always tell you, the easy way is black magic. And that's why black magic is so popular. The dark shit, the dark stuff, sorry, I shouldn't of course then, the dark stuff. This is, this is the path to extreme energy this is the part to this energy think about energy it's these people become even if they're not psychopathic proto-psychopathic this is the rush that psychopaths get when they kill somebody what the Ted Bundy say when I see the life going out of somebody I feel like God there's almost a transfer of the energy into the black magician or the person involved in this depravity this is what keeps them filled with adrenaline. This is what keeps them filled with dopamine. And adrenaline keeps you young. It keeps you fit. Also, testosterone levels are increased. And so is melanin, which is in the reptilian cortex of the brain. And the color of it is blue, blue blood. And surges of norepinephrine, the stress hormone that triggers this as well. And they're in a constant state of hypervigilism, vigilism, hypertension, but not out of a fear-based thing. And it keeps them younger, longer. Their hearts beat better. Their physiology works better. Their neurology works better. So look for the ones who are really, really old and seem to be in excellent shape. <laughs> 